<laughs> hey guys, it's I got started early today. Tried to switch my camera up, so if the picture quality is not so great, I do apologize for that. Um, I'm gonna try to position it a little bit better. There we go. I have been working on. Oh goodness, it's really bright, isn't it? Mm. Oh, over there. I'm working. <laughs> I can't get this light right. Oh my goodness. I'm going to turn it off on my baby. That'd be better. There we go. Not so much glare. Sorry about that. I've been working on my son's wedding. And uh, as I'm working on it, I thought, this is a lot of work. But then every project seems to be a lot of work, um, especially if you're a beginner. So this is invaluable for you who are beginners. Decided, I think I want to learn how to sew. Or I know how to sew, but I need to start doing some stuff. Um I did a video a while back called uh, The Pilot's Checklist and What's It Got to Do with Sewing? It's very important, but it's a state of mind. Um, when you're doing project planning, whether it be big or small, um, get a, make a checklist. You know, do you have all the materials you need? Do you have all the scissors you're going to need? You're going to have, all, you know, do you have all the uh, colors to thread, that sort of thing? Do you have enough fabric? Um, and then where are you going to put it? You know, how are you going to organize it? So, the items I have here to show you are part of my project planning. Um, with the wedding, of course, I had to get a little bit more organized than I normally am. Sometimes I just kind of blow the room up with everything. Um, you know, it helps you maintain that mentality of being staying organized. But just have fun. And the main thing is, like, if it starts to irritate you, walk away. <laughs> if you're working on part of that project and it's just like, and all you do is yell at what you're doing, get up, walk away, get a cup of coffee, get a cup of tea get a soda, whatever, um, fresh bottle of water. It, uh, it, it helps to refresh. Um, this is a long project. A wedding is a long project when you have the items that I have to do. Okay. So I start off with any project you want a project bucket. Okay. Um, this is the nice size. This is about six inches deep. I think it's like 18 inches wide. I mean, long and about 12 inches wide. It's deep enough to hold a pretty good sized project, but it's great for a small one too. What I do when I start with my project bucket is I start out in it. I put the pattern in there. This is my collection plate. <laughs> um, you put your, you, know, you have your pattern, you put that in there. You put a note in there like, okay, if you're buying the material, it's a project that you're coming out, you're doing, then, then you want to do that. Um, if you've got someone who's asking you to make something for them, you definitely have to have a project bucket. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts. And if you end up doing one or two projects at a time, you want to make sure you label them. I labeled this one for the wedding, uh, the wedding, the date. And when I choose for myself, because I know how my sewing habits are, I don't know about anybody else, but um, that's realistic as far as a final completion date. Because this is this uh, this is around a, a time a specific time frame. You're just doing it for yourself for the heck of it. You don't need a time frame. You just put under what you're making. You can put under my dress or my pants or my husband's vest. <laughs> um, and if you have ever done any sewing before, a lot of times what happens with me is you know you take the pattern out, you get the pieces that you want, you cut them out, and you have to try to shove that stuff back in that little paper envelope. It doesn't always go back the way it came out. So that's why they came up with these, this wonderful, and they didn't know, this sewing organizational tool. It's called a Ziploc bag. <laughs> but you have Ziploc bags, and some people like don't like the plastic. They want to be the, you know, I'm, I'm all for the planet. Don't get me wrong. But then you can also use manila envelopes. I like these because they're, the, uh, they're like twice the size of a pattern envelope. Now, what you can do with these, if you're going to use this, is you can take your pattern and you actually tape it to the front. You can take that pattern envelope, literally, if you want to. I, I have a file cabinet downstairs getting ready to get used big time for this purpose. Is you put the pattern front on here and you cut, cut, the, cut it out. Cut the front and the back apart. Put the back on the back so that way you have all the measurements that you need for it. So you go through your file cabinet and you pick up, you see the pattern. It has the picture of what you want to make, right? And he goes like, okay, so what do I need for such and such size? And you just turn it around. Isn't that awesome? It's an awesome idea. I thought so. But if you don't like 
if you don't want to do that, you want to really kind of conserve on space and you just want to put like stack them in a box or whatever, then you can use the plastic Ziploc bags if you want. Um, the freezer ones are really cool because they have a white box here. And so you can write on there, you can put the pattern number, you can say who it's for or anything you want to. Now, ideally, you would have maybe maybe a box of some kind or even a bin like this. And for each project, have them in inside. And that way you, you can say, you know, like you can number them. If you want to get overly organized, like sometimes I do, number the envelopes. You know, I got to do this one first. <laughs> number one, number two. Um, but, you know, you will find your own niche. I'm just showing you some tools that I use. And that have become very invaluable to me uh, as far as staying on, on task. Um, so the number of bins. That was the next question I was thinking of myself. I go, well, I need one for the project when I first start it. I'm going to also need one for usable scraps. And you're going to say usable scraps. Some of my projects, I cover buttons. Yep. Cover buttons don't re require large pieces of material. I mean, about, you know, a size of a quarter. So if I have a scrap that's at least two inches wide, I'm going to save it for a little while. And then if I don't use it after a second month for, for anything, depending on the color, because some colors I keep no matter what, black's one of them. Black, red, blue, and green. I guess it's all the primary colors, isn't it? Or, or sort of. Anyway, I got these little guys. I can find these in the dollar store. These are all, I mean, they've got these and they have smaller versions of this. I have a bunch of these. Um, and then we have the cloth ones, which are in various sizes and shapes. And I just slid this too far away. I'm just going to put the camera somewhere else. But you have these organizational bins. And see, I left the tag on it when I bought it and I took my P Touch. And what I did was I put a label in there to tell me what was in it. And that's being organized. <laughs> I'm not always that organized, but I try. I'll, I'll share with you what's in here in a minute. So, bins. One for trims even. So the one for scraps, I'm going to have another one for trims. If you're going to be putting fringe on something or you're going to, you know, and, pff, the buttons for a sec. You can put them all in that bin. You know they're in there. So you can have a trim button. It comes in handy. Uh, sequins, pearls, all that. Right now, I've got pearls and beads everywhere because <laughs> they also make jewelry. Um, then you want an end project bucket. You want another one like this so that as you finish an item, if it will fit in the bin, you put it in there. If it doesn't fit in the bin and you're hanging it on a hanger, my suggestion would be to have some kind of a tag system that you hang off of. It says, this is for such and such for the project, and you have to deliver it or or whatever, or if it's for yourself, you don't have to do that. But if you're doing it for someone else, it's always a good idea to keep your closet organized also. I understand. I've got two wedding dresses that I'm working on right now. I love wedding dresses. I must be in, must be, because I'm doing my son's wedding and I got two wedding dresses hanging up that I'm adorning. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, and once you finish the project, the end project could be a box. Um, if it all fit in a box, keep your eyes out. Eyes open and make on the lookout for boxes that you might use, like when you're in the grocery store or someone ships you something from Amazon. Say, oh, this is a nice box. I go, Do you have a storage storage space? Do you have a basement? Do you have a closet that you built in the basement? I, I built a closet in the basement for my stuff, um, for my inventory. <laughs> um, put it there. And that's then you can organize that just like a retail business. You know, if you're doing this, to make a little bit of extra money, or you're just doing it for the fun of it, and you maybe might want to sell some stuff online, go for it. Uh, but you do have to be organized, or else you will get swamped in your, oh gosh, where is that? I saw it. Let me give you a word of advice. If you've been looking for something in your house, that has nothing to do with sewing, by the way, but it does. And you see this item, and you go, I've been looking for that. Put your hands on it right then and there and put it where it's supposed to go. Don't expect to remember where you just saw it. Nope, it's not going to happen. You're not going to remember where you saw it and then you're going to need it and you're like, I should have picked that up when I saw it and put it away. <laughs> I did that three times yesterday. I want to kick myself now. So now I'm giving you the advice that I need to take for myself. Okay, project bins. 
And that one, I mean, you can keep it at wherever arm's length um, as, as you go. Um, but I have these were the, and I need to label this while I'm saying it out loud. These were made, or these are from the vest that I am making for my husband's. I, I'm going to write on here, wedding, David's vest. Oops, I said his name. Name dropper. <laughs> and this pattern number is very similar to the one I'm doing for the groom. So I need to make sure I put the pattern number on this envelope so that when I start putting the loose pattern pieces for my the groom, his is his pattern. I don't put it in this one. They're really similar. The only difference is the groom's vest has... Uh, It has tailoring to it, for lack of better words. So it's more fitted. My husband's a big guy, and he doesn't need fitted. So, And I always put on here. I don't put McCall's duplicity or anything like that. I just put 8808. I mean, I could put McCall's on there if I want to. Um, I've tried the foreign fabrics. I'm not going to mention the name. And they frustrate me. The instructions are not clear for us USA citizens, I guess. I just had a, the first vest that I made. It turned out fabulous, by the way. I have to sell it. You want to know why? <laughs> the reason why I have to sell the first vest I made for the groom is the groom, <laughs> my picky son, he didn't like how I fixed it. And that was so funny because I showed him a photo and he said, he didn't say anything. He didn't say a darn word about it. And then he turns around and he goes, how, how fast can, can, can you make another one? I said, you don't like it? He says, well, what's with the ribbons on the front? And I'll tell, I think I've talked about this snafu, but I'll, I'll reiterate for you beginners so that you know about your tools, how dangerous they can be. <laughs> I have this beautiful vest to make. <laughs> it ended up beautiful, you asked me. Um, I don't know any slender guys, so what's going on online? Unless somebody comments and says, hey, I want to buy that vest. <laughs> it is hunter green. This is the colors for the wedding. I think that light back there is too bright. Should I unplug it? I don't know. Um, I covered the buttons and all that. I got the buttonholes going with the uh, vintage buttonholder attachment. And then I had to open the buttonholes. Beginners, listen up. <laughs> Us advanced folks, we're not always that good. I mean, we have our moments. The next to the last button hole on this vest decided to give me trouble because I had a thickness of fabric that was kind of wasn't real. It's not real thick, but it's thick enough. So there's two ways you can open a buttonhole, and that is with you can use a Seam ripper, which a lot of people do, but let me tell you, on a seam ripper <laughs> that has this little red, little red thing at the end, see the little, little red knob, there it is, it doesn't stop this, no it doesn't, uh-uh, if you're going like this, it's going to keep going until you stop your arm, well, when you're working with slippery material, this is a satin. It's a slippery. And you've got your fuss and fighting trying to get through that buttonhole. And it's giving you, you just give that one little nudge too much. I sliced the front of this vest with this. A good inch. And I panicked. And so to fix it, I tried putting, because there's a lining underneath, I put some fusible inner uh, stitch witchery of, uh, Fuse this little stuff here, see through, you know, it's just glue to glue the fibers back together. I tried to make the fibers all line up, and it's, I knew he would see it. He, anybody that looked at the front would be able to see it, and I freaked out. So I kept racking my brain. Think outside the box, think outside the box. Hey, you beginners, remember, you need to start thinking outside the box sometimes. <laughs> How was I going to fix this without having to start all over again? Right? And I thought, wait, I have that ribbon. And now, it gives it like this 
tuxedo shirt look. I said, hey, I mean, with the stripes, you know how they get our pleated in the front, tuxedo shirt look. And I thought, well, this is really cute. I like it like this. He apparently didn't. And so he asked me how long it would take to make another one. So now I have to make another one without those beautiful ribbon stripes. That's going to be plain, just plain old that with two pockets in the bottom. Oh, that was another thing. It didn't have pockets uh, in the pattern. I had to make them up, put them in there. It had for a welt or a placket or whatever, you know, a flap that goes on the bottom. But this lovely vest has pockets. You can put your fingers in. That's about all you can put in is your fingertips. That's good for maybe two quarters. Change for a meter, parking meter. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the way the look is. So, with that said, your tools. You get your bins. You've got those organized. What do you put in the bins? Now, I have the bin for the, the savable scraps. I also have a bin for throw it out. And it's a big 12-incher. You know, the organizer cube kind. I have that one. It's on the floor over here. And then I have this hodgepodge. This is my treasure box. This is my treasure box. Come on. Tilt this down just a little bit. Maybe we'll get rid of some of that glare. A little bit better. In here is everything you will want to or want, need to grab. The grab box, so to speak. Um, for those items that you know specifically that you're going to be grabbing more frequently than others, I put those in another one of these wonderful things, the Ziploc bag. Um, you can label if you want. I don't. I just know that. I put all my scissors in this bag, or I put all my seam, you know, the tool, tool things. Now, you're going to laugh. No, don't, don't laugh. If you plan on videoing yourself to learn from your mistakes or learn from your successes, I have in here a USB plug. What for? Well, if you're recording with your phone, you're going to need this handy. That's in there. <laughs> I also have the spare cord. There it is. It's in there. Um, you need to have your paper cutting scissors to cut your pattern. Do not use your fabric scissors. Please do not do that. When you cut your pattern out of the envelope, you use this. Then, after it's pinned on your fabric, you use your fabric scissors. I suggest having at least three good pairs. Why? Because someone's going to get a hold of your scissors one day. They're going to cut paper with it. It's going to mess them up. and You have to get them sharpened, and that's no fun. Um, since I, this project, I know I'm going to be doing buttonholes and I haven't done buttonholes in forever. I have my vintage buttonhole maker attachment. Now, if you're a modernist and you swear by the new buttonhole makers, as far as tools goes in here, I have one of those lovely things. Now, this is the best kind that I can suggest, especially for you people who are beginners on your sewing machine. It has the buttonhole stitch, but you have to have one of these to use that. Um, you put the button in the back, it's spring-loaded, and this tells the foot how far to go to make the buttonhole that is in the buttonhole programmed into the sewing machine, how, how to do that. It very, oh, if you have to mark darts or dots or any of that from your pattern to your fabric, make sure in your tool bin or your, your I call my grab bin, markers that are wash out. These are washable. These are wonderful. There's also some, they're called like a gel pen, but it's for fabric. And I've discovered these, ironically, they work very well. They do a nice fine little line. So, and it, and these actually iron out or wash out. Now that's pretty crazy, but uh, they do. Then if you're going to video yourself, as I was saying, and I digressed, thumb drive. Uh-huh. Save it on here. Label it or do it have some kind of uh, what do they call it index card system where you know number one number one has such and such, such on it. This is the 32 gig one. This is a good size for doing several uh, videos of your own items. The other thing that I keep in here is a pair of short, sh ha, short, sharp scissors. Say that five times fast. I dare you. But <laughs> these, I love, I don't even remember where I got these from. But these are the best little scissors. They're like comfort grip, and they're pointy, and they they dip into those little corners. Like, you know, when you have to go into some tight spot, these are wonderful. And if you don't have these, another pair that I have, it's like, why she gets me scissors? 
they have purpose. And there's these little guys. They curve up. They are extremely sharp. I've stabbed myself with these, reaching in for them. <laughs> I got to be careful because they are sharp. And they're great for when you're, if you do embroidery and you're cutting away the stabilizer, this is what you use because this gets in there and doesn't, doesn't uh, do any damage unless you're me. And, of course, your seam rippers in here. I have two kinds of seam rippers. But I lean towards those little 99 cent ones for some reason, I guess, because I'm not as apt <laughs> to slicing fabric if I have a little one. And these are typically the one that comes with your sewing machine is one this size. And I think that's why. They know. These are these are sharper than the big ones. Mm -hmm. They are. So you don't have to give as much oof to them when you're, you know, putting it through a buttonhole. You don't, have, you don't have to use as much uh, torque. Then, of course, a rotary pack. Now, this is the smaller blade. This is the, I think it's 28 millimeter. And then there's the 45, which is the normal size one. I love this for lots of reasons. If you can get away with not having to use your scissors to cut your pattern out after you've pinned it to your fabric, and you can use one of these, do it. Saves your scissors. Blades and no thing, you know. <laughs> you get a pack of five blades. This will save your scissors from getting dull because even though you've cut your pattern out from the envelope with paper scissors, a lot of us don't cut it all the way to the line when we're cutting it out that way. We pin it on the fabric and then we cut the rest of the paper off. That's what your rotary cutter should be used for. And um, that gives you a nice smoother line. Now, with satin or any other kind of fabric that could fray, you have to have these. Reason being, you have to have pinking shears. Pinking shears cut the jaggedy teeth in. And it's a zigzag. It's like a zigzag stitch. And it, uh, it forces the fabrics to not fray. Fraying is, is, is pulling away from the normal weave. This won't let them do that. Also, with satin, if you've never worked for it with it, <laughs> and you don't have one of these, the first time you work with satin, I want to hear what you think with regular scissors because you're going to get followed by, I call it hair or satin fuzz everywhere you go because it frays and it sticks to you and it sticks to me. And I'm like, my husband is like, there's all kinds of thread on the hall. I go, oh, sorry. <laughs> then I have to go with pinging shears. I forget to use them sometimes. Um, I have two pairs of pinking shears. One is Fiskars, and then there's these. And they don't have a name on them. And I don't remember where I bought them. My, I have a sneaking suspicion I got them from Qtex or from Amazon. But these are the best pinging shears I have ever used. They, they just, they're just wonderful. They cut so good. They don't have a dull spot in them. But I don't cut paper with them either. <laughs> So any other uh, things that you're, no, these are just, t these are tips and things that I use for you uh, gals that are beginners that I use. Now, I'm not saying you have to get all of this stuff because I know when you first start beginning to sell, it's, you know, you got to watch your budget. So pick out the things that you know that you probably would use, but you have to have scissors, scissors wise, I say pinking shears, a regular pair of shears and paper scissors, three. I may have seven. That's just me. I do a little overkill. <laughs> okay. And I do a, this. This is a clear. Um, this is using quilting. As a matter of fact, it's a quilter's acrylic ruler. It's two and a half inches wide. And I use this when I'm using my rotary cutter on my patterns because sometimes I tend to slip. I have arthritis in one of the fingers of, one, of my one hand. So I have to be careful with that. But I use this for stability and for nice, clean uh, uh, line. When you have these to so get cut it, your pattern can't be on you just on your table to use this with your cutter. You have to have what they call a self-healing mat. You put that underneath. So you're going to have your fabric and your pattern on top of the fabric, on top of this, and you use this as a guide when you're cutting with the rotary cutter. With scissors, you don't need this. I have several sizes of those. I have one that's on the table here that I used. Um, it's 30, it's 25 inches by 30 inches long. That's a big one. Uh, I tried, to, 
I try not to use too much, but sometimes I just have to have the tools, so I do quote the quoting along with it. Um, what else do I have in here? Oh, yeah. And for us gals who are sight challenged and you're going to thread the needle on your sewing machine, or even just a regular needle, I got tweezers for, st <laughs> for steadiness. I do have a magnifying glass as well. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Marking darts on a pattern, from a pattern onto the fabric. There are a couple different ways you can do it. Beginners, um, how I learned to do it. That's warm in here, sorry. I learned to do it with a tracing wheel. Where's the tracing paper? It's in here. Somewhere. And there's tracing paper. Did I do bury it already? Probably. Oh, there it is. I buried it. You get a little package that's the tracing paper. And in it, it'll have sheets like this. They'll be different colors. I think this envelope had yellow, orange, even had white in there. Well, white's great if you're working on black fabric. But... When you use the tracing paper with your tracing wheel, you put this. Let me see if I can kind of demonstrate. Okay. Here's your fabric. Okay. <laughs> Here's your fabric. Your pattern's on top, right? It's pinned. So in order to mark where this buttonhole is, I would have to take the pin out where that, if there's a pin there, and you put the colored side of your tracing paper under that where you need to trace it. Now, if this is on the wrong side and you need to see it on the right side of the fabric, what do you do? You take the, another piece of the same color. You're going to put it on the other side as well. And then what you're going to do can I do it on this piece? No, I'm going to do it on a different piece of it. I'm going to use a different piece of fabric just so I can show you what it looks like. Hopefully, it'll show up. I'm going to put this on the scrap piece. Okay. I'm going to lay it out. That's the pockets in my husband's vest. I want to do it on there. I like that. So, you've got your pattern, fabric, and your tracing paper, color side facing the fabric. And you're going to take your little tracing wheel, right? And you're going to just draw on top of where that buttonhole uh, but when you're doing it on front and back you got to give it some more pressure than normal um, you want it to show through on both sides I'm going to see if I can do this it shows up on both sides this does out also it's a kind of a wax kind of thing let's see did I do it yes I did I have just enough I hope you can see this guys when you do your tracing oily tracing paper I'll see you too okay focus and I don't know if you can see it, guys, but it's right there. It's on that side. And there. Oh, now you can see it on this side. See it there? I can see it in the monitor. But, yeah, it shows up on both sides. That way, you're going to see it, whether it's on the front or the back. Um, It actually goes, you know, it's something matching up. And uh, I hate tracing paper, personally. But then it's easier than using the marking pen on a dart because if you use a marking pen on the uh, with it, on it, you have to lift the, the pattern up and you have to draw with the marking pen, right? And, get, and it's like, okay, is it lined up? <laughs> Tracing paper is no brainer. You're actually drawing it onto the fabric through it with the paper. Um, yeah. So I did actually use this for this project or this for these few items in here. Um, it would just just became easier that way. So I went back to old school. <laughs> I like that. Uh, let's see. Oh, the other thing that I have in my little uh, grab bin is thread. Um, make sure you have enough thread for your project. Um, rule of thumb is this. And everybody argues with me on it. But when you are sewing, the thread you use that is visible, like when you do a hem, you do not want a darker shade of that color. You want a lighter shade. And I get people all the time, so they no, it has to be exactly the same color. No, it's supposed to be darker. No, no, it's supposed to be lighter. 
And a lot of people don't realize that there are shades of gray that you can use that will blend right in with anything, just about anything except white, white and cream, maybe yellow. I don't think there's a, a gray shade. Of, but I've used gray. I have used gray, a shade of gray for even a color like hunter green. I got down to where I didn't have time to go to the store. I didn't have any more of the, the shade of green that I wanted to use. And so I, I ended up with this. It was a greenish gray. I don't know if I still have it out here or not. Maybe. Huh. And if you don't want to go all the, you know, all crazy wild with bins and stuff, they always have something like this. You can find something like this, you know, a thread stand. I know they have the wooden ones that are, you know, but they take up some room. But this doesn't take up a whole lot of room. And I don't know where to get these. These came in a desk. Uh, whoever I bought the desk from had these. Um, now, as you are, I mean, I, I never had one of these until recently. And I've always wanted one because I know the benefits of it. You can make them, but it's not the same. I tried making one. Not the same. It's called a ham. A tailor's ham. A tailor's ham is absolutely imperative to me now <laughs> and invaluable for when you are pressing your garments that have curves. The shoulders, right? The armholes. Because of one thing. The material, when you're pressing it on a flat surface, is not going to allow the fibers to do that little bend that they're going to do while you're wearing it. So you get one of these guys. There, uh, this one wasn't that expensive either. I think I got this one on a special. It was like $15. I should have spent $15 40 years ago. Really should have. My stuff would have looked a lot better. And if you're doing this for other people, it, this is wonderful. For cuffs, on the end of a sleeve, or, you know, like I said, shoulder seams, all that. Anything where there's a curve. And it doesn't matter if you iron on either side. It's flannel on one side. The flannel side is which those you use. Um, because of the, the way the fibers are in flannel, it allows the fibers of whatever it is that you're pressing on here to, to, do, to do the movement that they need to do. It, it, it gives space or something of that nature. So I have... That I have a <laughs> I have a mannequin head <laughs> over here that has the bow tie on it. <laughs> you don't have to have one unless you're done it. Like if you like doing necklaces and stuff, yeah, that's a good thing to have. But I just did just because I wanted to display it. And uh, I don't know how and somebody had a bunch of these and they were selling them. And these, there were some guy ones and I was like, okay, so I got some guy heads. I have some lady heads, but so. <laughs> That's the bow tie, the groom's bow tie. Hello. And I wanted to make sure I knew how to tie it in case I have to tie the groom's tie for him in case he's too nervous to do it. You know. But the mo one of the other most besides your 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 scissors, pins. There's debate on pins. If you're going to be doing pressing, glass head pins. No ifs, ands, or buts. Don't get those big plastic ended ones. Those are mainly for quilting and hand stitching. I use the long ones sometimes just to hold stuff in place until I can like baste it or whatever. Um, there's different different things you can use for keeping your pins contained. You can keep them in the container they come in. This came in this. This is a great deal. 750 dressmaker pins for $3.99. Gosh, that's amazing. And this has become one of my most valuable items. It's a heavy duty, and they use them in like uh, auto shops and things, so they don't lose the bolts and the screws while they're working on a car. But you can get these at Harbor Freight online. I think Amazon sells them too. They sell them too, too expensive. Go to Harbor Freight; they're cheaper. Uh, and sometimes they give you away free. Uh, they have a coupon. But when you are working, and your pin—I mean, my pins drop on the floor all the time. It's it's inevitability. Beginners advance the light. You're gonna find pins on the floor. But if you have one of these, all you have to do is go like this on the floor <laughs> and you'll pick them right up. Look at this. See, there's some on the bottom. And there is a, a machine needle on there. Well, that's interesting. Well, it's because then you have to change a needle and it falls on the floor because it falls through the desk. This one is bent. You know, normally you can't really see cer certain bends in, in needles, but this one I can see it. For those of you who are beginners, I uh, may have said this before. 
if you're stitching fine and you go have lunch, come back and your machine all of a sudden is not stitching, it's, you know, can't get a stitch out of it. What's the first thing you do? Rule number one, take out needle, put in new needle. <laughs> Rule number two, <laughs> rethread it <laughs> and watch the magic. Uh, <laughs> I forgot that those two rules, by the way, <laughs> recently with my surger. And that's because <laughs> I forgot a surger's a sewing machine too. I I was it was stitching great, beautiful, overcast stitches. And then I went and I came back, back to it, and it wasn't stitching hell. What's wrong with this thing? I thought the timing was off and all this other thing. And I, I when I get like that, I'm like, and I'm I'm just gonna stop. I stopped, came back the next day. What'd I do? I said, I just put needles in this. I said, well, I'll put new needles in it. Put a new needle in it, not a problem. Somewhere in that project that I was working on, one of those bent needles got slightly bent and it just said, oh, I ain't stitching, no more. So, no stitches, new needle. <coughs> new needle and rethread, especially on the serger. That's dry in here too. I keep my ice water close at hand. Okay. This has been pretty much just a, a recap for some people. Um, but having the organizational bins has been a bit, it was an epiphany for me. The next thing I have to do is get this haircut. Um, some of these items are quilting aficionado equipment. I love quilting equipment, by the way. I love the rotary cutters. I love the, the clear ruler and all that. Um, make sure that you have everything you need when you get started. Your paper scissors. Your, if you're not using, if you're cutting on cotton, you don't need to have pinging shears, but... Pinking shears also help if you're like in a hurry and you're making something for yourself really quick or whatever. You don't want to have to overcast stitch your uh, project. You don't have to. Pinging shears keep it from fraying. There's also a product called Fray Check. It's a little liquid thing. And you put that at the end of your seams and it will not fray. It keeps it from fraying. It kind of like glues them in place. Um, doesn't wash out. From what I understand, it is permanent. Um, there's... A lot of situations that I've heard where people call in panic, and I'm like, "Can you hem my pants?" <laughs> I'm like, "One, yeah, I need them done now." <laughs> I said, "I'm like, hey, you got them? Yeah." I said, "You go out to the store, and you get this stuff called heat and bond or stitchery, but get the kind that's see-through, like that. Some of them come with paperback. That's for beginners. Get the paperback one because." Then you don't have to worry about glue getting on your iron like right away. So if you put the paper back, like this had paper on one side. So you put the paper down or the glue side down on where you're going to do it. You pull the paper back. Then you fold up your hand and iron your pants and then you're all good to go. And it's pretty much a permanent bond. And glue does break down, turns yellow and dries out. But not this stuff. This is something I don't even know what it's made of, but it's wonderful. So I, you know, I, I promote that. <laughs> heat and bond stitch witchery kind of thing all the time for folks who are like freaking out because there's the hem of the skirt just came out and I've seen oh my goodness don't use safety pins <laughs> it's, just, it's just so tacky uh I know someone who did that but you know there are all kinds of neat tools that you can use use what is appropriate for the job for the project for me, doing a wedding, I had to have absolutely everything on the shelf, so to speak, including the kitchen sink almost. Yes. Oh, yeah, I did need the kitchen sink. I had to dye some bags. I did. <laughs> These are the, uh, they were previously canvas colored little bags. They were stiff, really hard. I had to, I had to wash them like four times. And then I read online, if you put tennis balls in the dryer, it helps soften them up. It actually does. But these are going to be little gifts for the bridesmaids. And so if you want to make something, well, 
beginner's zippers, unless you really want to be dangerous, start you can do zippers. I would prefer a makeup case that had like maybe a Velcro closure or a snap. But this is one that's basically finished. And it has little pockets in here. Um, yeah, weddings make me crazy. I get really creative. <laughs> I'm just showing you this to these guys because some of you beginners might say, well, I just want to do a, like a little makeup pack. Well, this is one that's kind of, of course, I have an embroidery machine, so I get to do fancy. Um, this is one I'm getting ready to sti stitch it completely done. It doesn't have any frillies, but it does have the embroidered initials on it. Isn't that cute? That's what my embroidery machine does. This material is fabulous. This is from husband's vest on the back. I asked him, I said, you have to have a green vest for the wedding. What do you think about roses, honey? <laughs> He's like, huh? So I showed him the material, that material. He goes, that's beautiful. I said, can I put it on your vest? <laughs> He's like, yeah. I said, you went on the front or the back? He says, put on the back. I said, that's what I was going to do. So he has a vest with a rose on the back. I'm going to share that all that of uh, other things with you. You've seen the vest. You saw the bow tie. Those are the bridesmaids' gifts. On my uh, Facebook page, I have the flower girls' dresses and sash that I do for those. And uh, soon will be the groom's vest, the one that he wants. I think it's so, it's so boring. It's plain. This is a plain vest. Really? It's, just, it's like this fancy one without all this fancy stuff. Just the buttons and two pockets. But that's him. So I'm going to get back to it. But I would strongly suggest if you are a beginner, make sure you make yourself a shopping list for your project before you actually do the project. Pattern. Oh, one other thing that I do have that it can... Mm, if I were to lose this, I would be in major trouble. I mean, for myself. Oh, come here. Where is it? When you're at, the next time you're at a dollar store, and you see those little books, they don't have anything written in them. They're just long paper. Grab one. Seriously, grab one. Keep this in here. Or in your, somewhere where you know where it is all the time. That keeps you on track especially if you're doing stuff for other people but for yourself you can put measurements in here you, you're making clothes for yourself and your measurements change right you date it you put your measurements and you take just make sure stuff fits there are so many great uses for this i use it sometimes for an idea book you know just a small version of it you know and, I, you know, and then i'll start looking for patterns for this and you carry this with you sorry this is one of those tools that you can carry with you. I know it's kind of big. But you'd have to carry it in your hand unless you have one of those big honking purses um, and throw it in there. But if I know that I've got a project coming up and I know I have information that I need, like color, the color of the fabric that you got, that you need to have, the type of that you need, what you're making, write it in here. It saves you from writing stuff on little pieces of paper and then you lose the piece of paper and you go nuts because you can't find the piece of paper you just wrote it on. That's what I used to do. I used to write notes down, like even on a three by five card and take a little three by five card and write on it. And I go, oh, where's the damn card? <laughs> I don't know. But um, I almost forgot about that. And that's very important. I mean, you can, this will help. One of these will stay organized. And if you're a beginner, you don't want to lose the love for learning how to sew. I had moments like that in the very beginning where I was just like, Ugh, this is annoying because I didn't have an organizational mindset because if you think about it, the patterns are instructions. You have to go one to 10 or one to 14 or whatever, and you have A, B, C, D. So if that's structured, you can't be unstructured in making because it's this way. That's how things are made. Like there, there's an order of things. So I hope that the tools that I use and the little things that I, uh, you know, grab onto. I have a whole another list for fixing stuff. <laughs> um, 
if you want to adopt some of that, you know, try it out. Some things that are, you know, the same or similar as to what I've done for myself. I'd like to hear about it. So please do leave me a comment about it. Um, I said, you're like, oh, I got, I got one of those magnet things for my pins and I'm so glad I did. Yes. <laughs> you know, I didn't know about those. I always went with the same little, you know, little plastic magnet thing or the tomato or the little rest wrist thing with where you put the pins in on, on the, on the wrist. And I don't use those anymore. Because, well, the wrist thing got on my nerves. The plastic thing, sorry. But the tomato kept fall, you know, kept getting knocked. No, <laughs> I don't knock those over. <laughs> and also, if you have a, a machine, like vintage ones are all metal anyway, you can stick it right there on the very back, back of it or off to the side. And it doesn't go anywhere. It just sits there. It sticks there. It stays there. I had forgot to take one off one day and put the sewing machine away. And the magnet and the pins all went in there with it. But it didn't fall on the floor. <laughs> so if you keep yourself organized, you'll have a lot much more fun. Um, you'll come up with ways of this the other day. I said, I got to cut this thing. And I want to use my scissors because the scissors don't. They're not curved, right? So I got the little rotary cutter out. And I put this in the armhole. And I went, went around this. I use this as a guide instead of a straight roller. <gasps> Another hint. <laughs> So I may have suggested some things that even you people who are advanced might want to try. Please do. And let me know how it turns out. I would love to see some projects. And if you want me to send you a list of items that I, that I showed today, just let me know and how I can get it to you. I'd be more than happy to email it or mail it out to you. Um, my grandmother said that <laughs> she said I had a knack for this stuff. And it took me a while to figure out that she was telling me, that, yeah, God gave you a gift. I go, oh, that's what she meant. Because I've gotten over the years to where I can look at something and tell someone, you know, you need about two inches off of that. And I'll measure it as two inches. <laughs> and they look at me like, oh, you're scary. But no, I've just been doing this a long time. So that's why I keep doing it. And that's why I'm sharing. And that's why you beginners out there, if you really love creating, this is a perfect avenue. It's a perfect outlet. Sometimes it's frustrating. Yes, I will not lie to you. But other times it's very rewarding. Especially when you have a young lady who asks, can you fix my dress? And then you see the dress on her. And it's four inches too small across the front. And you can say to her confidently, yeah, I can fix that. I have to put an inset in it, but I can fix it. She comes back, puts it on, and she looks at you and says, it fits. With this look of, oh, my goodness, how did you do this? And then her next words are, I have to see how you did it. So we had to turn the dress inside out, and I showed her what I did. <laughs> That's why I do this. I don't care. I just love the fact that it's, if, if it's something you're making for yourself, then you say, Mm, I look good and I did it. You know, if you're doing it for someone else, like they look good and I did it. And they're going to say, I can't believe how you did this. That's the best part about sewing people. The best part is eating and having so much joy. You just can't stand it and you got to share it. So here I am. The so what seems is I'm sharing with you. So find your joy, find your passion. This is mine. One of them. <laughs> just have fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs>